Hey, uh, I'm David Friedlander, and I'm going to talk to you about life editing. Basically, what we are out to do is to start a design, architectural, and lifestyle movement around doing more with less. And oftentimes, we call it the, the luxury of less. We, we, we think that people in general, and, and Americans specifically, could stand to do with a little less stuff, using a little less space, and using a hell of a lot less energy. So that's what we're really out to do. But there's kind of s some obstacles. Um, America has grown big um, with you know, cheap consumer goods, cheap credit, cheap building. We've just become a nation in cheap food. Uh, we've become a nation that's just been, we're, we're bloated. So we've got our big pimp ride. We've got our big pimp house. We've got our big not so pimp belly. I mean, this is a perfect illustration here. In 1950, the size of a soda was eight ounces, all right? Nowadays, before Bloomberg uh, took away our big bottles, uh, up to 20 ounces. So, you know, uh, greatly, greatly supplementing uh, our, 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 our girth. And, and like I was talking about, our, our houses have grown e enormous, all right? I mean, I know some of us are not quite so tuned into that in New York, but... In 1950, the average size of a house was 900, uh, of a new house was 983 square feet. By the, by the height of the housing boom, it was uh, 2,700 square feet. Now, what's even more interesting about that is 1950, there was actually more people living in those homes. There was 3.37 on average, whereas in, in 2007, it was down to 2.6. So basically, per capita, we're, we're consuming three times as much space. Now, the, the recent housing boom and bust has reduced that a little bit, but we're still like above 2,000 square feet. We're still occupying a ton of space. And you think with all this space that somehow we would have enough room for all our crap. But we don't. We've created a $22 billion personal storage industry. We, we store this stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen like storage wars and hoarders and you know, all these things. We are like stuff obsessed. Um, there's, you know, stuff is so cheap and we can't seem to get rid of it. And we don't know where to put it. So you think with all this awesome stuff and with all this space to do what we do, uh, we'd be happier. But you would be wrong. Uh, happiness levels have basically flatlined since uh, in the last 60 years. So basically what we have is we have more debt. Uh, I mean, a, a, an enormous amount of credit card debt, enormous amount of housing debt. We, we have the, you know, uh, the U.S. comprises somewhere around a quarter of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions for the world, yet we're 3% of its population, and, and we're miserable, you know? Uh, so, or if, if not miserable, we're, we're, we're no happier. So, obviously, this way of, of more and just, like, increase and just more and more and more and more consumption and more space, it just doesn't work. So, what we're doing with Life Edit is, we're pro you know, we're proposing a different way, and what, what we say is less is more. So what we're saying is less stuff, less space, results in less, less CO2, less greenhouse gas emissions, a smaller footprint, more money in our pack, pocket, and more, more space for the things that are actually really important in our lives and the things that actually lead to, to us happiness, you know, to being happy, to the relationships and, 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 you know, and, our, and crea creating things. So this is what we're up to. So... You know, I'm, I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a writer by background, and, 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 and there's a great quote by a French philosopher, uh, Blaise Pascal, and he says, I would, have written a shorter I would have written a shorter note, but I didn't have the time. And, you know, the way I think about it from a, from a, a literary standpoint is the world in a certain way is like this big, rambling, rough draft, you know? There's a lot of really great elements in it, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, just amazing things going on right now, but it's a lot of times it's just sort of obscured by, by all the superfluous shit, uh, pardon the French. And that's, that's Pascal, not me. Um, so, you know, what we're, we're talking about here is really reducing things down to its essence, editing, you know. And that's why we say editing is the skill of this century. So, you know, really getting down to what's important, whether that's, you know, an archi you know architectural conceit, whether that's product design, whether that's relationships or your job, just getting down to the essence of things. So... Where we started was at home, and uh, basically we have the, light, the first life edit apartment. Graham, Graham Hill, uh, as, as, as mentioned, he bought this uh, pretty dumpy-ass 
place in Soho, uh, 420 square feet, wasn't much to look at to begin with. But what we wanted to do was, was we created this really demanding brief. We, we said what we wanted to get out of this space. So we really wanted to pack, so the space is 420 square feet, and we wanted to pack it with about, seven, you know, about 700 square feet of utility. And basically, from an economic standpoint, we wanted to prove a point that if we could spend like around 1000 to 1500 dollars per square foot, that we could actually really compete with a much larger space and save hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the way we wanted, the way we, we got the, you know, we, we, we arrived at the best ideas is we crowdsourced, we crowdsourced the project. So we launched an international design competition. We got over 304 uh, entries from all around the world. The winning, was, the winning design was uh, called One Size Fits All by a couple of Romanian architecture students. And it was this beautiful jewel box. Um, it, it exists today. I'm actually crashing there tonight. And uh, fulfilled on all the, all, the, the, all, the, all the requirements were like, you know, guest, guest accommodations for two, uh, a housing, or it could, it could afford a, a couple, um, two, two workstations. So there's like all these, all these things that you would never think of that would be possible in, in a small space. So this is, uh, this is a rendering of, of the space from uh, above. And this is the main room. And you can see there's a, a desk there, a standing desk. Apparently, if you stand, uh, if you sit less than three hours a day, you live an extra two years. So you, you guys should all stand up right now. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a dining table that fits underneath the breakfast bar. It expands to seat four, six, eight, or even 10 people. Uh, there's a moving wall that comes out on tracks and reveals a guest room with bunk beds. And there's a curtain for extra privacy. The, the master bed folds down over the couch. There is a, a projection screen and more, uh, more privacy with the, with the curtain. So, in, we've, we completed the apartment in May and had a New York Times article and they called it the apartment of the future. Uh, here's some of the pics as it looks like now and not just computer renderings. Uh, this is where I crashed last night. Um, uh, this is actually a uh, dinner party we had uh, just um, the other night. It, the, the space is actually not yellow. This is just a crappy picture from my phone. All right, so where are we at? So big deal. So we got this really cool apartment in Soho, and, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're all very cool. That wasn't the point of the project. The point of the project was really to show what was possible in a small space and also really to bring it to larger developments, and that's really where we're at right now. And in, you know, in, in the two or so years that the project's been going, there's been a major explosion in terms of what are often called micro units or micro apartments, and there's big, big time developments in uh, Boston and Chicago and... Uh, uh, in Portland, Oregon, um, San Francisco has a lot of activity lately. They're trying to reduce the minimum square footage that you can build to 220 square feet from 290. This is a really cool project from uh, a company called Smart Space. And what's really great about this is the units are all three, 300 square feet, but it's all prefab construction. So it like goes up and it's going up in a blink of an eye. It'll be ready this fall. And then of course there's New York. Uh, and this is, this is really what we're totally psyched about. So there's this uh, competition called Adapt NYC. So like I said, a lot of cities have minimum square footage requirements. And in New York, it's 400 square feet. Now, New York is expecting another 800,000 people in uh, by 2030. So having these antiquated building codes, are, it's just not going to facilitate that. It's, it's not congruent with, with the trajectory of the city. So uh, Bloomberg, the Bloomberg administration launched this design competition called Adapt NYC. They're offering up a, a, a tract of land at Kipps Bay for developers to submit plans for micro units. So the, the units of the building are between 275 and 300 square feet. And, you know, and they're, not, they're not rat holes. They, ha you know, they have to have light and, and uh, you know, they're clean and they're, they're, they're beautiful apartments. And we were actually... Uh, there was 33 entries, which is about three times the normal uh, entries for this kind of competition. We were on one of the teams. So uh, we're, that's, you know, one of the things we're up to. We're actually also up to uh, working with uh, the, the Zappos Corporation, building out their corporate campus in Las Vegas and d incorporating some of these principles. So there's a lot of, a lot of exciting things going on in, in, this, in this sphere. So, 
So, so here's some of the things that we found, you know, that really work in small spaces. It's not, again, you can, you know, it's, it's not a big deal to have a small space, but to make a small space work, you really have to incorporate both design and behavioral elements in, into, 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 into your space. So one of the things that we, you know, found is like, you gotta, you gotta hide things wherever possible. You know, here's a, here's a perfect example. It's like this, this wall becomes a, a dining table or uh, this is an interesting project in London. It's called the Yo Home. If any of you heard of Yotel, it's by the same developers. And the the bedroom descends over the very salacious-looking lounge area there. <laughs> uh, nesting and stacking. You know, uh, this is a really cool chair by a, uh, a guy named Paul Menon. You know, one chair becomes three. You know, we brought this stuff to housewares. This is a this is something called a, a Nest Nine, and, and basically has almost all the kitchen necessities that you have in one compact piece. So it's you know it's it's designed like in in total. Uh, collapsing and flattening. This is the table that we used in the life edit department. As a council, it's only 17 inches, and you really got to see this to believe it. But it goes to 114 inches. And seats seats ten easily. Uh, you can get this at, at resource furniture right off the right off the shelf. This is the uh, what, the thin bike that Graham helped design with a company called Schindelhauer. And you know, uh, kind of like Paul was talking about, one one of the things it's oftentimes hard to store your bike, and you know, if you live in a, a Brooklyn brownstone. So uh, you know, this this goes from 21 inches to six inches wide, uh, and you know, oftentimes it's the width that's the problem. Uh, really, you know, another part is getting down to the right size stuff. Who in God's name uses five burners at one time? You know, like we're, we're obsessed with like, you know, oh, I got an industrial kitchen, big effing deal, you know? Like, so, so we're using portable induction burners in the life edit department. You just pull them out of the drawer when you need them, you know? And usually we only need one of them. Um, do you really need this many pairs of pants, you know? Uh, um, I was actually talking to Paul and the last two speakers have both been wearing outlier pants. Uh, they're made of technical uh, fabric and the, you know, they have a dress cut and you can really get by with two pair of them, and uh, you can wear them quite a bit. I asked my wife. Um, so, uh, multifunctional products. You know, this this coffee table becomes a dining room table for eight. Um, sometimes multifunction can be just like a, one piece of clothing that's really good. You know, like the the classic, you know, black cocktail dress. Uh, less but better. Like really focusing on the quality, not the quantity of stuff. Um, we have a term we call, or actually coined by a guy named Saul Griffith, heirloom design. You know, think about things that could be handed down to the next generation. So who gets sick of a Barcelona chair? You know, the thing was designed like 70 years ago and it looks just as new today. Or a great pair of, you know, a great pair of shoes that can be resold indefinitely. Or, you know, a La Creuset pot that could basically is good, for, good forever. And, you know, a lot of us think like, oh, well, that stuff's really expensive. But, you know, we think about it this way. If something's twice as expensive, but last four times as long, it's basically half, half the price of that cheap, you know, such and such that you wanted to, you know, that's, that you wanted to buy. Now, of course, design challenges are just, just part of it. In order to live in a smaller space, you really have to change your behavior. So one of the things we say is like, edit ruthlessly. Like really just scrap, you know, get rid of everything you don't need. You know, whether that's that ugly ass shirt you've been carrying around from, a, you know, apartment to apartment that, that one day, or like you're gonna use it as your painting shirt. You know, or that behavior, you know, that just doesn't quite get you where you want to go, you know, like, like it's not just about stuff. It's about the way that we, we conduct ourselves. Uh, you know, we're not, you know, I'm not a believer that, that, that technology is a cure-all, but for some things, man, it's really good. Uh, you know, this big stack of papers, we could scan it, you know, this really nifty, you know, bookshelf that, you know, everyone can see the titles. It takes up a lot of space, you know. So, you know, getting an e-reader, e-reader, you can throw thousands of volumes on your phones nowadays or on your Kindle. Um, and, and here's like, you know, a concept, you know, the, the, the point, the, the, the talk is about, you know, the city 2.0. And this is really something that, uh, that we've, been, we've been thinking about. And, you know, you think about it, like, America has been working on this, this model of everyone having their own personal mainframe, all right? But think about it, like think about life as a netbook, you know, and, and the city is the cloud and really just accessing all of the things that the city has to offer. 
And like your micro unit, your small apartment, is really just, it's like your netbook, you know? So, um, you know, some of the ideas that we have and how to achieve that, you know, with our larger developments, we have what we call a product library, where people can check out things that are really, you don't need that often. Um, like, how often do you need a ladder or a stock pot, you know? Like, but they're nice things to have when you do have them. Uh, you know, bookable, uh, bookable guest rooms. So like when you have your parents over or something like that, you can, you can, you can check it out rather than, you know, a guest room optimistically is gonna be used like 25% of the time. So, you know, why pay for it 100% of the time? Or Zipcar, uh, this is actually in Dumbo, it's right here. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, having on-demand trans transportation, uh, you know, like Paul mentioned, uh, there's a city bike program coming in, in the spring. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, like public spaces, it just, again, like, like Paul said, using the city as your living room. Like you don't need that much private space. It's, privacy is overrated, you know? Like people are nice. Um, so, and the city really is really getting hospitable towards public spaces. So, you know, this is one of the pedestrian plazas uh, we were talking about before. Uh, of course, there's the High Line and God willing, the low line, uh, which is, you know, the, the subterranean park uh, in the Lower East Side. And, you know, co-working spaces are really taking, taking foot. Uh, one of my favorites is a, a building in, uh, uh, over on Flatbush called uh, Metropolitan Exchange, which is like a, a bio lab and a maker space and a, and a, and a shop. Uh, there's something called the new lab, which is coming right, right close here, the, uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yards. And they're taking this humongous, I think it's 160 square foot uh, warehouse, derelict warehouse, and turning it into a, a manufacturing zone and co-working space. And that's, 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 that's proceeding. Uh, and of course, there's Third Ward, which I'm sure everyone knows about, has classes and shops, and uh, they're actually expanding. They're going to Philly, and they're also making a culinary uh, version of that. So. You know, you don't need to, to own this stuff, like to, to access it, you know, access over ownership. So uh, the conclusion, so what's, so what's this all about? So uh, this is my son. In July, in the course of nine days, my father died of lung cancer and my son was born nine days later. And, you know, it just really brought home that life is really short, you know, it's, it was, uh, like the, the, the talk, what to do before we die. You know, it's like, our life is short and it's really, it's too short for, for superfluous crap, you know? <laughs> like, like we really need to start editing out the things that are not important and then really also just bring forth the things that are important. Like, the, you know, like even great stuff, great spaces and, and you know, most of all, great relationships because that's really what the city's about. It's not about the, you know, the majestic mountainscapes or whatnot. It's about people and it's about relationships and it's about creation. And, you know, when we get down to that, when we get down to the essence and when we edit out all the rest of the stuff, you know, our lives can really, you know, really take on a measure of sanity and happiness and, you know, just, just be wonderful. So, you know, what we say is it's time that our stuff in space supports our lives more than our lives support our stuff in space. So... With that, I thank you.